The focus of today is about resources because uh, the academic job search process involves multiple steps and multiple things that you have to do to sort of position yourself effectively for the roles that you're applying for, be those postdocs or non-tenured roles or tenure track roles. Um, and so I, I wanna make sure that you have access to those resources because they are gonna be helpful to you. They're gonna be helpful to you in addition to the advising that, that our uh, career services can offer you um, uh, as part of that process. So perhaps some introductions would be good. I am Dr. Joseph Barber. I'm the Director of Graduate Career Initiatives at Penn Career Services. And I oversee the two graduate teams of advisors at Career Services that work with PhD students and, and postdocs. First things first, and I think this is important, is that um, as a PhD student or a postdoc, uh, I do want to acknowledge the fact that you are going through a process which is not easy, a challenging uh, academic program in a challenging job market. Um, and I want to uh, sort of assure you and reassure you that you have wonderful skills, wonderful stories about your research to tell, that you are competitive for the faculty jobs that are out there, and that the lack of opportunities in terms of numbers of jobs in your field is no reflection of your abilities and your skills and your research and your dedication to what you're doing. And so I know it is challenging. I know the job market has not rebounded and may not ever rebound in the way uh, and I know that we work with PhD students all the time who are pivoting and leveraging their skills in different directions as they need to. But all of these things that I put up here are true. And I wanted to sort of give you an energy boost today to say that you are amazing in the work that you're doing. And we appreciate that work and, and want to support you in those decisions that you are or those steps that you want to take in your career. Um, so here's what we're going to cover today. Right. So an overview of resources are going to help you with these sort of four main areas for your uh, faculty job search in general terms. If you've been to one of our sessions before, you know that we're always going to be talking about networking. It is a foundation for some of the steps that you want to take. So I'm going to give you resources to support you in your academic networking, which is a thing that actually does happen and is important. Um, materials is a thing that I'm going to be talking about again tomorrow when we talk about creating a cohesive application packet. Uh, but I'm going to touch on resources today that are going to be helpful to you. And then interviewing and negotiating, I'm going to mention just one or two resources that are going to be beneficial for you uh, in, in that context as well. So where are you in this process, right? So it kind of depends on your discipline. It kind of depends on, on the journey that you've taken thus far. If you're a PhD student in STEM, then you may be looking for a postdoc. If you're a PhD student in the humanities, you may be looking for a faculty position, but there may not be many full-time tenure track roles that you are uh, finding in the job market. So a postdoc or a visiting assistant professor position or a non-tenure position. These are all things that are uh, that might be out there. Each of these sort of steps and each of these destinations requires a slightly different approach in terms of understanding the value that you bring, the skills, the impact of your research, how you can talk about your teaching, whether teaching is prioritized or not. Is it a research intensive institution? Is it a teaching intensive institution? So there's a lot going on here that I think is important to sort of realize that, um, you know, these things can affect the, the process that you're, ta that you're taking and, and how you position yourself. And really, this is the journey that you are all on as part of this um, uh, application for academic jobs, right? So wherever you are, whether you're applying this year or hoping to apply next year, really try to understand what faculty careers mean and represent and look like, not just at an institution like Penn, where you are right now, uh, but at an institution that might be very different, different types of institutions, different sizes, state level, private ones, uh, liberal arts, right? You need to sort of have a full understanding of what these institutions are, and also how they value your research and your teaching approaches, because they will value them slightly differently. You may find that you're, you know, you are doing your research here, but you may be looking for a role in a totally different type of institution. And so knowing the differences and knowing how to position yourself, very important. And that's going to come down to academic networking. I'm going to give you a couple of resources that you can use to really answer some of these questions. What do search committees really value in most cases? They value presentations, they value publications, they value funding. These are the sort of the tangible currency of the academic world. And the more that you can sort of point to the impact of those things, the more that you know, they can see the value that you bring. Doesn't mean that you all need uh, extensive grants to bring in or a whole long list of publications, but you do need to demonstrate the impact of your research if it's a research uh, role that you are looking for moving forward. So these are critical things to sort of understand and, and sort of know where you are in this process. You also need to be able to create your own narratives about who you are and how you teach and how you integrate diversity into your research and teaching and why service is important to you as part of your role, right? So those narratives are gonna be key to your application materials, to your interviewing, and you have to have confident versions of those to help people get excited about who you are and what you bring. There are lots of PhDs out there in the market. So what is it about your approach 
to being a scholar, to being a researcher, to being a teacher that sort of not makes you stand apart, but that adds value to the, the department or the institution that you're applying to. Then obviously there's the applying and the interviewing and negotiating. And for many of you, that's gonna, that has already started in terms of submitting applications and we'll continue over the next few months to, to do that. And then decision-making, right? Decision-making is important because at the end of the day, you have to choose if you have offers between different offers and you don't, if you don't have offers, you have to decide, well, what's next? What's the next step? Do I look for uh, another postdoc or a postdoc? Do I look for a visiting position? Do I change direction and leverage my PhD skills in a different career path that values that, that background that you bring? And there are lots of paths that value that background. So these are all important sort of questions that sort of, or parts of the process that you need to sort of understand where you are to sort of position yourself effectively. So in terms of being ready for the job market, uh, these, you know, your funding, whether you have funding at Penn or whether that funding's running out, that can be a sort of a motivator to sort of decide that you are ready. Whether you are applying for funding that you might be able to bring with you, that's going to be a key motivator as well. Whether you have publications that are pending that you want to get out there before you apply to make your application more impactful, or whether you really want to invest your time as a new faculty member doing that next publication, writing your next book about your research. These are all conversations that certainly we can have with you at Career Services, but you're having with your advisors and your thesis committees as well. And your advisors are not infallible in terms of the advice that they're giving, nor are we at Career Services. Certainly some people have been given recommendations by their advisor that they're not ready to go on the job market, but have gone on it anyway and have found positions that are out there, right? So sometimes you have to make your own decisions and advocate for your own steps moving forward. You are gonna be the best advocate for yourself. No one is gonna advocate for you more than, than you, right? So we are as at Career Services here to support the decisions that you're making and provide advice for that. But clarity in terms of how your skills match different types of institutions out there, and in terms of well, how you can talk about your future research, again, if research is your, your, role, your goal moving forward, those are gonna be critical, right? Search committees love it when people are confident about how their research can be impactful and about how they can bring value to a, an institution or a department. Um, and so trying to figure out then if you, know, you have the right skills or how to figure out who can help you figure out if you have the right skills is so important. Um, and, and so the, the thing that I want to sort of touch on today is really the, the, the what networking looks like within an academic setting as a foundation for really positioning yourself for your, uh, your, your next application. Right? So here's a list of people that you know of already who can provide insight into the process of applying for academic jobs and, and insight into the strength of your candidacy for those roles. Your advisor, sometimes you can have a sort of a fraught relationship with your advisor or your PI, right? So it's always great to build out your academic network beyond that. You can look for a former advisor. You can look for members of your thesis uh, committee. You can look for just for an academic mentor who's not a part of your, your thesis uh, committee at all, right? It's uh, the, the broader that network, the more insight you're going to get. Alumni from your department who've gone on to be faculty members, they're out there. There's, we'll talk about how to find those. Alumni from the other departments, other disciplines who are at the types of institutions that you might be interested in and want to learn more about, they're out there too. And then don't forget your, your professional academic associations that are out there, right? So I just did a couple of searches for you know, the types of advice you might find. The American Historical Association has research uh, resources for people on the job um, on the job market uh, and uh, and can be supportive of that right so this is an association that is a great support not just for academic jobs but for jobs beyond that for history the american anthropological association right uh, they're talking about the guerrilla job market here in terms of landing an academic position but again more resources that they're sharing from this scholarly association that you're going to find helpful and then finally the uh, uh, american society of cell biology um, has a CV and resume review uh, matchup system. So if you're a member of this, you can get a member to look at your industry or in this case, academic CV to give you feedback on that. So don't forget about these other organizations out there that you may be part of, but may not have invested too much time in because you're busy doing your research. There are great resources out there that you can leverage to do that. But I wanna focus on, on the people sort of around you, the sort of the, the pen network and how that is valuable to you, right? And so, Certainly, if you are a PhD student, you are part of the alumni network. But even if you're a postdoc, even if you're a postdoc at CHOP, you can be part of this network too, because you are closely affiliated with Penn. And so there's no, everything I'm showing you right now can be something that you can do, whether you're a Penn degree holder or, or, or not, right? So this is, these are just resources that are out there. Now, LinkedIn doesn't feel like it's going to be the best place to go for information on the faculty job search, but really it is. And it's a great resource to help you 
find connections and build connections and answer the questions that you have about being on the job market. So what I've done here on LinkedIn is I've gone to the University of Pennsylvania school page. And once you get to this page, you can see this alumni, alumni tab here and I've clicked on alumni. And then I can do a search by where the 197,000 alumni that, that are listed in this typically, where they live, where they work and what they studied. And I can also do a keyword search as well. And so what I did in this case, I took the 197,000 and I did a keyword search for professor, which is a great keyword because there are a few other jobs that have the word professor. Um, and there are 15,000 people who had the word professor associated with their, with their experience, right? Somewhere in their profile that's sort of brought up in terms of one of the roles that they've had, their current role, the previous role, uh, and so on. You can see there's about 3,000 of them in the greater Philadelphia area. And then on the right, you can filter that down by, by uh, what they studied, right? These aren't a direct match to what's happening at Penn. These are broader than just the, the Penn environment, but you can see history there with 1,000, economics, biology, psychology. So you can find faculty members who are Penn alumni, who are, who've studied in your field on LinkedIn. And I'll sort of explain why you want to find these people in a, in a second. But first of all, I want to show you the mechanics of that. So these are just some of the people that came out from that search when I did that, right? And what you can see is who they are. You can see what they studied. You can see when they graduated. You can see where they are right now. You can also see how you're connected with them on LinkedIn, right? So these are all second degree connections for me. I don't, I'm not connected with them directly on LinkedIn, but I know in certain cases for Riley, I know four people on LinkedIn who know Riley, right? So if I wanted to start a conversation, there's four avenues that I can use to do that that are gonna be helpful, right? So each of these people has information about their role, about their journey, about their lived experience, about how they were successful at positioning themselves. Sometimes they don't know how they were successful, they just know that they were, but they might be able to give you insight into that process. Each of these can be a great contact uh, for you to learn about an institution that you don't know much about. But let's take a sort of a subject area, right? So I said there's about a thousand history professors who are Penn alumni. Um, I did a search for those. And, and then you can see that there's a diversity of people in different roles that might have insight for, uh, for you. An assistant professor at NYU, an adjunct professor, a couple of visiting professors, a term assistant professor, so a non-tenured role, and a postdoc researcher doing sort of uh, academic research at, at sort of in, a, in an adjacent um, research facility here, right? So your goal obviously might be to get a tenured role, but understanding the nature of these roles, understanding the challenges and successes that these people had in getting to where they are, understanding how they are leveraging their visiting positions to hopefully get a tenured position, all of that is information that you don't yet have but can really build on as part of your own job search process, right? So again, each of these people can have answers to questions that will be helpful to position yourself more effectively for the roles that you're interested in. So that's just an example of different roles, uh, you know, within uh, uh, faculty roles. For some of you, as you're thinking about your, your job search, there may be fewer opportunities in the US, there may be more opportunities elsewhere. You may be returning to home countries to apply for faculty roles. Don't forget that you can also search by geographical location uh, when I was doing showing you that alumni table. So here are faculty members in Toronto, Canada, in Spain, in Beijing, in Melbourne, Australia, in London, England, and in uh, uh, Brazil, right? So if you are interested in, in uh, faculty roles internationally, these are great perspectives to be able to gain. Again, these are all Penn alumni. They're all from different disciplines in this case, but they're all able to share with you and probably very um, willing to share with you their own experiences, right? They can't help you get the role, but they can talk about their experiences and you can use that information to sort of say, well, what can I do with that information to pos position myself more effectively for a role that, that's out there? So uh, just as an example of the great value of the sort of slice and diciness of that uh, LinkedIn alumni tool to be able to find people with a relevant background who can answer the questions that you have. Now, interestingly, you know, if you are uh, if you are applying for uh, um, faculty roles in other countries, right? Um, we at Career Services don't necessarily know what is distinct about applications in all of the countries out there that you might be interested in. My sort of um, best practice is to always go to the academic institutions in the country that you are interested in and look at their career services pages, because just like our page at, at Penn Career Services, most of our resources are free to access. And so you can find a lot here. So this is just the London School of Economics um, uh, talking about uh, applying for academic jobs, their CVs and their covering letters, cover letters, covering letters, right? Distinct aspects of what they're doing. They're going to talk about 
you know, formatting your CV using A4 instead of letter size people. All of this is important if you're trying to position yourself for a role. And in this case, they gave great um, samples from NSE alums uh, sharing their CVs and their, um, and their cover letters, right? Things that you can easily access and, and leverage. So highly recommend this as a, as a good best practice. Do this for US institutions as well. You can go to any of the Ivy League institutions career services pages and I guarantee you'll find resources similar to our resources at Penn Career Services, but maybe providing uh, you know, different perspectives on that. And, and these are my colleagues who work in these offices. I work with them as part of a professional association. We're a very sherry um, kind of uh, or, uh, sort of uh, set of people and advisors. So I'm sure they would welcome you using their resources uh, as well. Funding, I, as I mentioned earlier, is a key part of a, a faculty application in many cases. If you can demonstrate that you have a track record of getting funding, then you can leverage that as you're applying for positions and say, look, I've done it in the past, I can do it again. If you can get funding that helps you transition from a postdoc to a faculty role and bring that funding with you, then you can become a very attractive candidate as well. So going back to the, the LinkedIn tool, you can search for grants and funds and, and awards and named awards that might be out there that might be key in your field. And you can basically ask the question, well, who has one of these and how did they get it and how have they used it, right? So for the, the K awards that are sort of help you transition from, from postdoc to faculty member, you can bring those to your institution. Uh, there's, a, there's 15 people or so here, um, did I see 15? Thought it was 15, um, who have insight into that experience. Like they have these awards, uh, they've used these awards, they've applied for these awards. Great uh, information about how they position themselves for that, right? So Katie was one of those. She's actually a, a Penn undergrad alumna, but that doesn't matter, still, a, still an alum from Penn, um, currently doing a postdoc, but their, wor their work is currently supported by K99 uh, R00 NIH grant. And so if you wanted to sort of understand how to better position yourself for those, to understand some of the challenges, Katie would be a great contact to reach out to uh, to help you with, with your approach there. So this is obviously a STEM focused one. If you're interested in Mellon fellowships that might be applicable to the humanities and social sciences, I did a search for this. We have 332 people who are Penn alumni who have some mention of these in their profile. Again, they may be helping coordinate the program, not necessarily receiving it, um, but Melanie here you can see uh, if we uh, pull up her profile, again, a um, uh, undergrad from Penn who went to Brown doing PhD, um, possibly uh, no, PhD at Brown right now, uh, but still um, great part of your connection, great part of your network, and can talk about how they applied for this dissertation completion uh, uh, fellowship from the, the Mellon Fellowship. So a wonderful resource to sort of help giving you, give you insight into these things that you may, may not have. Now, all of these people that I've been showing you are potential contacts, right? And they, there's an opportunity for you to reach out and have a conversation with them. And these types of conversations we call in our office informational interviewing, right? So it's it's a, a form of networking, but it's not a big room of people networking. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you have with someone who has insight and answers to some of the questions that you have based on their own experience, right? So you, you don't reach out to someone who doesn't have a, a Mellon Fellowship and say, how do I get a Mellon Fellowship? Because they don't know, but you do reach out to someone who does and say, how did you get it? What were some of the steps that you took? And then they can share that insight with you. This is a resource again, that's in our uh, the links that I'm sharing in the chat right now, again, just to sort of, so that you have access to that. It's an easy to read guide. It's gonna give you examples of questions that you can use. Um, and these are some of the questions that might be relevant to, you know, academic, understanding the academic um, landscape, understanding the funding landscape that, that may be relevant to you. Obviously, you can ask many more questions than this. These are just examples of, you know, how did you talk about your research when you were applying to different types of institutions? I see that you were at Penn, but now at a small liberal arts, what did you have to do with your research to position yourself? Talk about teaching. You can talk about, um, you know, what, what they think that search committees are looking for in their institution, which might be very different from any institution that you've been part of as part of your academic journey. Um, you can ask them about their funding. Do they have connections with people at funding agencies that they are working with that they can share with you? Uh, those types of connections can be really valuable because you can you then have a reason to reach out to someone uh, and um, you know ask them about what they're looking for in that funding agency, and then you might be able to adapt your application based on what you hear from the person who was awarded it, who you've reached out to, or based on the program officer at the organization who might give you some insight. So, so much that you can glean from uh, this type of networking. 
Now, I don't want to sort of say that networking is key and then sort of leave you sort of feeling uh, adrift. It's like, I, how do I get started? What do I do? What, how, you know, what are some best practices? So I also want to share with you some of our tangible resources to help you with this as well. One of the most important ones that we have, which is a paid resource that we pay, we pay for at Career Services so that you get for free, is the PhD training platform, um, previously called Aurora. So if you've heard us give one of these presentations, you may have seen that before but it's the PhD training platform by Beyond the Professoria. Now, as you can see on this slide and on the top here, they have resources for, for professional careers for PhDs. They also have resources for faculty careers. And that's what I, obviously I'm gonna focus on today, but this is a one-stop shop that covers the whole process of applying for faculty roles and, and combines not only a step-by-step -step workbook, but a whole set of resources that you can use to position yourself for that. The faculty careers section is divided into humanities and social sciences and STEM fields so that you get the different nuances of the application for the different fields that you're in. So you can check these out um, and you know how to decide if you are ready to go or when to decide if you're ready to go on the job market is a great sort of opening um, sort of presentation that you can look through and then you know you can decide based on this presentation what is the best strategy for you to gather more information about your candidacy about the strength of your application and they have fly on the wall networking opportunities as well right so what I mean by that is these uh, faculty career panels just like the one that Diane was talking about earlier that we're doing across this faculty prep camp where you can listen into some of the conversations with faculty members at research intensive and teaching intensive uh, institutions and learn about their perspectives and gain information and you don't even have to have any conversations with anyone these are recorded and you can just watch that it's not as going to be as effective as actual networking that you can do, but it's a great starting point to make you feel comfortable with this process of gathering information that's going to be helpful to you. The Faculty Career Strategies Workbook takes you through all of those steps that I mentioned earlier about gathering information, about networking, about putting together your documents. So they allow you to sort of uh, write down and go through and process how to set up these information interviews with faculty, right? And you can create a list and then just use the, the guidebook as a, as a structure so that you're not adrift and, and lost as you're working on these different steps. In terms of networking, that is not all, right? So if you are a Penn student or a Penn alum in, in, in whatever way that looks like, you have access to the My Penn Network, which is the Penn Alumni Relations networking platform, which is gonna be slightly more nuanced than LinkedIn in terms of breaking down where people, which school that they're in, which program that they're in, uh, that will be Penn specific programs, not the general ones that, that LinkedIn has. So if you go to the MyPen network, uh, you can do, for example, you know, alumni from the School of Arts and Sciences, getting a PhD in Romance Languages, who now have the job title Professor, Associate Professor, or Assistant Professor. You can see my search at the top. And you can see there's 72 or so people out there uh, that you can leverage in terms of uh, uh, reaching out to, right? So it's the same idea of gaining access to contacts and then deciding if they have answers to questions that you're looking for. Uh, the great thing about the MyPen system is usually that there's a, an email that you can find but with any faculty member, you can always find their email, right? They're the easiest people to track down in terms of finding their, their institution page. Um, I did the same for classical studies. So we have 20 uh, alumni here, uh, again, in these roles. And one of the things that I wanted to point out on this set of, uh, of alumni here is Caroline here, because she has this available for mentorship sticker here, which I feel is slightly confusing in what it means, but it actually means that she noted in her profile that she's available to share career guidance with people, right? So the, the bottom uh, window here, my profile, if I'm creating my pen profile, I'm not a pen alarm, but I have a profile, I can say, yes, I am available for career guidance. I'm available to provide mentorship. I think provide is the word that's missing here, available to provide it as opposed to receive it. So if you are on my pen and you see this red box, it means that they have actively said, sure, I'm happy to answer questions, right? So you already know that they're more open to a conversation and you can mention that, hey, I found you on my pen. I noticed that you had the available from internship tag. I'd love to ask you a few questions about your, your background and your experience, right? So you can find very specific people from your field at certain types of institutions who are also uh, indicating, at, or at least they did indicate at one point that they were available to have these conversations with you. So that's a really great way of again finding more people to have these conversations and learn stuff that's going to be helpful to you as you're putting together your uh, campaign for applying for these roles. Okay, another resource that is worth noting is the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity, which is something that Penn, as the institution, probably the Provost Office, subscribes to. And it's like a $20,000 subscription, which means that you can gain access to an institutional 
sub account membership, right? So they pay for it and you can use it for free. So again, this is in the list of resources that I've shared in, in the chat. So you can take a look at that. Um, once you go into uh, this resource, you'll see that you can find the University of Pennsylvania as the institution who have signed up for that. And then you can get into it. And obviously I was looking at this in the evening because it's a good evening here, Joseph, well, very polite. Uh, but if you go to the resources tab here and scroll down to member resources, you'll see that they've broken that down into different categories, who you are right now. Are you a tenure track faculty member? Are you uh, a professional track or a contingent faculty or your graduate student and postdoc? If you click on the graduate student and postdoc uh, resources, there's a whole bunch that I think can be helpful as part of the conversations that we've been having about you know, this process of applying for faculty roles, right? So cultivating your network, it's, it speaks again to this idea of networking and finding people who can give you insight, finding mentors who can share their um, own experience with you that can be helpful. Especially valuable, as I said, if you have a sort of a touchy relationship with your current advisor and are looking for more independent advice. So this is a great sort of workshop to sort of work through uh, to find those connections. Uh, networking for introverts and for extroverts too, right? So we've been talking about the importance of networking. And as I said, I wanted to make sure that you had resources that you can leverage to help you feel confident with your networking. Here's just another resource to sort of walk you through the steps that you can take to be confident with your networking, whether one-on-one -on -one through LinkedIn or at the academic conferences that are gonna be roaring back to life um, as the world gets uh, into the next phase of being the world. Uh, back to normal is, I don't think, the, the right phrase anymore. Um, as, part of the, um, as part of this platform, you can also access um, workshops by Karen Kelsky, uh, wrote the Professor is In book and, and oversees that blog. Um, Karen has, has very sort of definitive black and white advice about what things should be like, and, and some of that advice is great, and some of that advice I, I don't agree to it as much in terms of it has to be this or has to be that, but all advice is good advice if you can process it and sort of integrate it into your narrative. So these are, again, wonderful resources to take advantage of uh, if you haven't done so already. I also found this, which I didn't know about until I was just on the site the other day, that you can um, you can request a buddy, request a writing accountability buddy. Now, this might be primarily for writing your dissertation, writing chapters, writing papers. They talk about it being part of your expanding your network. It can also be about writing your materials, right? So of all those materials that you're going to write, CV, cover letter, teaching philosophy, research statement, diversity statement, you may be able to find an accountability buddy to help you sort of stay on track with that, but also get feedback from someone outside of your field or within your field, or whatever that looks like, right? So again, another way of expanding your network in a really targeted uh, and easy way. So uh, don't overlook uh, those types of opportunities. Which does bring us nicely then to the application materials and resources that I can share about those application materials. I'm going to go into slightly more detail about some of these materials tomorrow in the cohesive application package workshop. But these are the general ones that you're going to be sharing as part of your applications. Research statement, teaching philosophy, CV, uh, a diversity statement of some form. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the broader cover letter that encompasses all of these things. Uh, sort of is a, a, another document. And then there's actually a few more that uh, can come up. Um, which I obviously didn't list here, but uh, things like uh, statement of faith, uh, writing samples, you know, these are things that uh, are additional, but, you know, much rarer in terms of, of the application process. Uh, the importance of these documents is that um, they are really not one and done documents in reality, right? So having one version of your CV and using it multiple times works in most cases. But I would say, you know, if I pose you this question, which one of these should be customized, most of you would probably say, well, definitely the cover letter, which is great because you want to customize the cover letter. I would argue that all of them can be customized in subtle ways for different types of applications, for different types of institutions, based on what those institutions say about themselves, based on what they say that they're looking for in a candidate. Subtle changes can make a big difference in your application. And one of the reasons that I sort of recommend trying to customize, which if you're applying for lots of positions can be hard, if you're applying for a, few, a small number of positions can be easier. But one of the benefits is that it takes what is a giant packet, you know, up to 14 pages or more of, of information and makes it much more meaningful to the search committee, right? Sort of a generic 14 page application is harder to read than I think one that is targeted to you as a search committee member, faculty member, because you've spent some time really thinking about what they're interested in and why and how your research and, and teaching background can speak to something uh, specific to that department. So any opportunity that you have to customize these materials uh, knowing what your audience is looking for is going to be beneficial to you. 
Uh, and certainly we can provide feedback to you on that process as part of our role at Career Services. If you are in the humanities and social sciences, uh, you can leverage the Imagine PhD tool, which is a free tool. Uh, it's separate from career services, but we, we talk about this a lot because it's a great tool um, to, to look at some uh, resources around your CV and cover letter in particular for faculty positions. So Imagine PhD is an exploration and planning platform for humanities and social sciences. You can set up a free account for this. Uh, once you get into that uh, platform, under resources, you can sort of find these job families, which are pointing you towards career paths that you might be interested in, which includes the faculty path, because it's really just one of many paths that are out there. But if you were to click on this faculty path, uh, you'll see that they split it into research intensive faculty and teaching intensive faculty. And for each of these subfamilies, there are resources that you can take a look at that are going to be helpful, right? So that for each of these subfamilies, they have an explore, connect, apply, and build skills set of resources. Under the apply resources, you click on this, they have annotated uh, sample application materials, a job description, a cover letter, uh, and a CV that you can look at, right? You can, they, they sort of annotated the job description to say these things are important. And then they've annotated the CV in particular to demonstrate where they've touched on those things as well. So these are just a couple of examples. Uh, you can certainly look at those for both the teaching and research. You can even look at those if you're not even a humanities and social sciences person, just to get an idea of how they've recommended customizing uh, you know, the, the materials subtly towards that uh, job description. So great resources to take a look at as part of that one. Jumping back to the PhD uh, training platform by Beyond the Professoriate. So under the faculty career section, again, um, not only do you have the workbook, but you have all of these resources related to uh, how to apply, teaching philosophies, research statements, diversity statements, teaching portfolios, right? So if you're interested in any of these different sort of sub-genres of materials, there's a, a, there's a workshop and exercises in the workbook that you can take a look at. This is the uh, humanities and social sciences version. There's also a STEM version too, because there are obvious differences in how people position themselves in how the documents look in, in what they're looking for from you. So having that nuanced perspective of a discipline is very important in this context. From the Penn Career Services website, we also have resources in all of these documents that we've shared to help you sort of put these together. I think a lot of time people are looking for templates. Do you have a research statement template or a teaching philosophy uh, template? And, and whilst we might give examples occasionally, we, we try to avoid templates because they become very limiting in how you want to present yourself, right? This confidence in your narrative and how your research is impactful or how your teaching is impactful wants to be sort of your own story to tell. Obviously, you can leverage you know, your field specific best practices to make sure that you're not straying too far from that. But don't go looking too much for templates that say this is how it must look. Um, try to think about how you want to position your own narrative for that. So uh, again, <clears throat> these are, are uh, free for everyone to access and, and, and you'll find some resources there that are going to be supportive of that. From a teaching perspective, the teaching statement comes in different shapes and sizes and different names. And I feel like every year I see a new version of the name for what this document is. Um, we are lucky to be partnering with our uh, colleagues from the Center for Teaching and Learning who are gonna do some um, presentations on different aspects of putting together materials related to teaching documents uh, as part of this prep camp. So, um, and they're going to also share insight into the diversity statement, which whilst not specific to teaching, touches on teaching and research and service, right? So the, the diversity statement brings together the three pillars of academia, teaching, research, and service, and, and ask you to, to reflect on how you see diversity, equity, and inclusion relating to each of those and how your approach to those things can be impactful to the institution that you're applying. So the uh, Center for Teaching and Learning has some examples that you can take a look at. Again, they're not templates, they're just examples that can sort of be helpful to you as you are positioning your own narrative for that. And on Thursday, uh, this is when our colleagues from CTL will be doing some of the presentations as part of this prep camp on uh, these types of materials. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. Many of you may have in intersected with CTL as part of their uh, teaching certificate and other ways. Uh, you'll know that they're very focused and, and great at giving advice on these documents, but we're looking forward to their presentations on Thursday. Research statements, again, come in all shapes and sizes in terms of what they uh, are called and what they need to look like. Some of them are one-page documents, some of them are three-page documents, some of them are, you know, have pictures in and, and, and figures. Uh, some of them won't have uh, uh, the space for those types of things. Um, the, the research um, 
you know, uh, the breakdown of the, the research statement is really sort of almost 50-50 what you have been doing versus what you want to be doing or what you will be doing, right? The sort of the confident research plan that ideally takes you through tenure for a tenure track job or takes you through, uh, the, you know, the one to three years of your visiting position, that's going to be important to sort of uh, reflect on in this document. Uh, these are conversations that I think you definitely want to be having with your advisor and your thesis committee because part of the questions that you need to address in this document um, are about whether or how your research is going to be publishable and how it's going to be fundable, right? Those are the fundamental questions relating to research that you need to answer in these documents. As generalists at Career Services, we're less able to sort of give you direct insight into how your research is publishable and fundable because we don't know your field, or as your advisor and your thesis committee, they do, right? So making sure that you're leveraged conversations with those and then coming to us with your document so that we can give you insight into whether it reads cleanly, whether it makes sense, whether it's structured nicely, whether you've summarized the key points. That's, I think, where we can be more helpful because we're certainly not uh, discipline experts for all of the sort of the, the great research that you're, you're doing out there. So that sort of brings us to this idea of one of the resources that I hope you are taking advantage of is the one-on-one -on -one appointments that you can have with an advisor at Career Services. Diane mentioned a few of those appointments are gonna be opened over the next week or so for you to access. Um, we are we are a small team for a large population, so I know sometimes you don't see availability, but we're always adding things on a rolling basis. And usually every day we have same day drop-ins, uh, virtual drop-ins that you can always take advantage of. Those are 50 minute appointments, so you're not gonna cover all of the documents for the academic job search, but you can certainly break down and prioritize one document at a time as you go through those uh, same day appointments. But always keep an eye on, uh, on, our, on our availability. We're actually trying to hire or in the process of hiring, interviewing and hiring for a new position in our office um, so that we have more capacity to meet your needs. But this is a really great uh, opportunity for you to get insight uh, into um, the <clears throat> how your documents match the type of institution that you're interested in. Uh, last year, we did the faculty prep camp again uh, in August. All, all those videos are the ones that we recorded are still available on our Penn Career Services YouTube channel. So we will try to make sure that all the workshops that we're doing are recorded and shared just to make sure that they are uh, available at all the times. So we know that you can't always make the, the times that we have. We want to make sure that you have access to these resources. The videos that are going to be recorded for this prep camp, so not really the panels, but everything else that's more informational will also be here. If you subscribe to this uh, channel, then you'll get notified uh, uh, when those videos are posted so that you can gain access to those. Now, the one place I would sort of steer away from in terms of a resource for actually looking for examples of your application materials are long-standing faculty at Penn, not because they have bad materials, but because the CV that they may share. So this is Kathleen, she's a, a tenured professor uh, in, in history. She has a CV right here, you can access the CV. You can pull it up and uh, this document is uh, sort of where she will be putting all of her accomplishments and all of her research and all of her publications as a sort of a, a catch-all uh, sort of resource. This is not quite what you need when applying for faculty roles, right? You need a more nuanced, you need a more narrative style application packet that demonstrates your value to a particular type of institution. So it's not just a long list of things. It's really more of a nuanced document where you are looking to craft and prioritize different types of information and highlight the value that you bring. So, uh, you know, a longstanding uh, professor at Penn, their resume may not be, may not be oh, sorry, their CV may not be the best one to look at. New faculty at Penn who've just come into this role probably have much more dynamic documents that are more targeted and more narrative in form that you can take a look at. So there's nothing wrong with Kathleen's document at all. It's not a criticism of that. It's just, if you are looking for examples, uh, aim for newer faculty who've been on the job market recently to demonstrate, because you'll see that their materials are slightly more focused and targeted than just sort of like a catch-all uh, CV here. So we made it through sort of the networking, we made it through the application materials. I want to touch on a few things related to uh, interviewing. So as part of the normal faculty uh, interview, in most cases, there will be a, a sort of a screening round, there likely to be an on-campus round. And as part of that on-campus round, lots of different types of interview scenarios, job talks, <clears throat> teaching demonstrations, lunches, one-on-ones with faculty, group meetings with students, and so on. Um, as part of this process, you, you're, you'll need to be ready for some standard questions that you are likely to get in any sort of faculty interview, right? So tell me about your research. Tell me about your teaching. 
Uh, what impact has your research made to your field? Um, how do you see yourself impacting the community or faculty members here, right? So some of these questions come up time and time again, and it's worth being ready for them, not necessarily to have a rehearsed answer, but to know that they're coming and to be excited to give an answer to those questions. Uh, what we've done as part of our work is we've asked uh, PhD students and postdocs to share with us questions that they commonly get on the faculty job search uh, when they're interviewing. And we've grouped those all together into a long, long list broken up by sort of teaching, research, uh, service type questions, academic service, and sort of general questions. And you can access those. And you'll see that, you know, here's an example of the research ones. You'll see that some of them are very similar. They're the same question asked in a slightly different way. So again, it's not, the goal here is not to try to come up with an answer for each of these, but to sort of know that, you know, uh, these are the different perspectives that people are asking about your research and be ready to adapt to your research narrative to be able to fit some of these questions. So as I said, this is just a snapshot of the research ones. There's teaching their service, there's general questions as well. Uh, some of them are kind of uh, specific, you know, one person got it and they said, well, this is what I got. So you, you may not get that type of question, but it's worth knowing that those questions at least were asked. Um, as part of the PhD training platform, uh, again, you can see for both STEM and humanities and social sciences, uh, going through the interview process, the, the job talk, uh, teaching demonstration, things like that, you can, you can get information here. Now, the one question that's always the hardest that people say that they get when they do on-campus interviews is the one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with faculty where they don't actually ask you any questions, but they say, so what questions do you have for me? Uh, and then you have to sort of lead and run the show in terms of making sure that you're asking good questions that promote answers, then, then allow you to respond to, to be able to share information about yourself that you would have given if they just asked you questions. So there's a strategy involved in some of these uh, um, interviewing scenarios. We're happy to talk about those. Uh, in our one-on-one -on -one appointments with you as well. Um, in terms of answering in, uh, questions, in most cases, in an interview scenario, you want to use examples to support your narrative, examples of how your research is impactful, example of how you've taught effectively, example of how you will work with different types of student groups and integrate diversity. Um, that often means telling these star stories, situation, task, action, result, or Carl stories. Um, uh, it means being ready to sort of make sure that in your job talk, you have key takeaways that you are getting across so that those don't get lost in, in part of a meandering sort of monologue about your research. So structuring your answers is actually really important. And, and the, the faculty strategies guide from the uh, PhD training platform has some uh, workbook uh, exercises to sort of walk you through that process. Big Interview is our general interviewing platform uh, that we share with uh, students and postdocs at Penn to help you with any interviewing scenario, right? So it's going to walk through how to how to create good star stories and how to be ready and practice for different types of questions. This is not overly specific on the faculty path. Um, there are faculty questions that you can leverage as part of sample interviews where the pre-recording comes up and you answer those questions. Um, this is one that I created just a, a, a sample assignment about um, common questions on the academic job market. Tell us more about your research program. Uh, how does your work, how is your work cutting edge? Um, what is your teaching philosophy? You know, standard questions that are worth practicing. You can actually complete this assignment on uh, the big interview once you set up your free account through our resources uh, and complete this. And, and usually it pops into my, um, pops into my folder and I get a notification. And then I, I'm happy to give you sort of very brief feedback on how well you did as part of that. So even if you can't get a mock interview with us, you might be able to do one of these mini assignments as part of the, the big interview platform as well. And then negotiation is the end of the process. You know, in an ideal world, there are offers that you get, perhaps more than one that you can negotiate with, but even if you get one offer, you can still negotiate. Um, so it is worth being ready for this, even though this may be a long ways away. Um, this is why we have a second part of our prep camp in October, where we're sort of addressing more, these more later stage uh, parts of the process. So, you know, you're not thinking about negotiating right at the beginning. One of the great resources that you can leverage here is the, the uh, Chronicle data on salaries. Uh, let me just flip over to my uh, web browser here. So what I did here is I looked for full-time faculty salaries uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, um, and you can see average salaries by rank. So for the different ranks of uh, faculty members, they've broken it down because it's all based on surveys that they do, breaking it down by men and women, Unfortunately, uh, there is a disparity here. So if we click between men and women, you'll see that those things go down uh, when they shouldn't. So that's upsetting. Uh, you can also look at different institutions and see where, um, where people lie in that salary level. Now, these are reported salaries. 
you know, for a private institution, you're based on what people are saying. For public institutions, you can find people's exact salaries pretty easily. Uh, they're usually accessible on, on state databases. And so uh, you can use that um, as part of your negotiation strategy. For many of you, you'll also need to have um, ideas about startup uh, funds that you're looking for. Again, that's a question that you definitely want to connect with faculty advisors with because they have done that before. It's also a great question you can ask when you're networking. What did you ask for? What do you wish you'd ask for as part of your startup? How much will you be able to negotiate for as part of that? And to do that you know, at different types of institutions might give you some insight into that process. So the, the Chronicle data is gonna be a, a great resource to use as well. Um, on the PhD training platform, again, it's really comprehensive in terms of covering everything. They have how to negotiate faculty job offers for STEM and humanities and social sciences field. Uh, so great resources to check out there. Um, before you get to the point where you need it. Right? So it's always helpful to have a little bit of pre-knowledge and not just be uh, surprised by that process. And then uh, as we wrap up today, some final resources. So Chris is a, a colleague who works at a, a different institution who's part of my professional association, the Graduate Career Consortium. He put together this great blog on resources relevant to the faculty job search. Um, uh, you can just take a look at the resources that he has. He connects to other, other things that are out there. He has information on research statements or examples of other people from other institutions where they're sharing samples and, and resources. Um, and so it's just one of those things where any information is good information. Any advice and resources uh, can be good information that's out there. So I like to share that because I felt like it was a really comprehensive overview of um, multi-institutional resources that you might be able to access. The Pan Career Services YouTube channel, again, this is where these videos are going to be posted. This is where the faculty prep camp videos from last year are posted. This is where all of our videos, a lot of which are focused on graduate students and postdocs, are posted for applying for faculty roles and pivoting your, uh, your process. So do please subscribe and follow um, because you'll get notifications related to that.